last little bit I want to talk about, it, and again, I wish I had more studies that compared Brangus to, to other breeds and, and uh, that, we could, that we could reference and talk about a little bit. But I want to talk a little bit about, about selection for tenderness, that, that really of the, the two, genomic tools that we have, and, and genomic tools are coming out all the time. There's some new things that were, were uh, brought before us and rolled out at NCBA and, and Phoenix uh, that several of the companies tend to bring, are bringing out new tools there, and, and the power of those tools is getting better and better. But I think it's clear that of the traits that we can work on with markers, no doubt tenderness has the most potential uh, for a couple of reasons. First off, it's a trait that's difficult to measure otherwise. Uh, from someone that worked on the NCBA project and all the headaches we had through there, tracking those steaks, getting them back, getting them cooked and sampled and all this sort of thing, it's a very expensive process. And I think if the most important thing we learned from the NCBA project is that, that collecting large amounts of tenderness data is probably not very practical. As much as we hoped it would be otherwise, that, that the, the cost and, the, and just the logistics of collecting large-scale tenderness uh, data is, is very, very difficult. Fortunately, though, that the, the calpane markers that were discovered at Clay Center and the calpastatin markers that were discovered separately in, in Australia as well as in Canada seem to have pretty significant effects, as significant as any genomic tool that's out there in terms of an improvement of a, of a quantitative trait. All the tenderness panels whether you, you buy them from Igenity or from the GeneStar or Pfizer group, uh, not exactly the same, but really the same in terms of that. And there's some good data from Cornell and others in the Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium that have tested the same bulls with, uh, with, with both panels and find very similar results. If your producers are asking you about, you can do, uh, my, my evaluation of that would be no, that you're going to get a pretty similar product for tenderness. And some other traits, maybe that not be the case. but. But for tenderness, I think that with whichever product that, that they would happen to buy, it's going to give them basically the same information. Both of them look at two SNPs in calpane, and the calpane gene and one SNP in the calpastatin gene. And the data says that really their explosive variation, that's a lot. That if you think about a trait that has a pretty high heritability, really, that most of the tenderness data would say it's 40% heritable or better, if you can capture half of that. Uh, I wish we could capture half the genetic variation on a lot of other traits of markers, but I don't think we're very close on very many of the others. But no doubt that if, if any breeder breeder wants to aggressively breed for, for tenderness, then I think the opportunity is there with some of these tools. What I want to look, what, talk about, and again, this is all from the, from the National Beef Cattle Evaluation Consortium. What they have done uh, is those samples from NCBA project and from other populations have been stockpiled where they, through that project, we, we stored, of course, the tenderness data, but also s stored DNA samples with the idea that we would use those populations in marker validation, uh, where we would provide the company with uh, anonymous DNA samples and ask them to report to us in terms of what kind of findings they had, and then we, we they, uh, at Cornell and elsewhere, would, would then analyze that data to determine the significance of, of the marker genotypes. But I think it's also interesting to look at gene frequencies in describing a breed. That, that oftentimes when we look at the, at the power of a marker test, we think about the idea of, okay, what's the, the power of, of the allele substitution of the favorable versus the unfavorable. But it's also interesting to look at the breeds and how they stack up and what percentage of favorable and unfavorable markers they would have or what favorable, unfavorable alleles they would have. And so these are populations from, uh, primarily from carcass merit. And so we have Angus, Red Angus, as I mentioned, the Charlet cattle and Carcass Merit were half Charlet, half Angus. They were straight Charlet bulls on straight commercial Angus cows, and so the calves were F1s. And so if you think about the gene frequency, uh, that that's not a Charlet gene frequency, that's the average of a Charlet and Angus population. <coughs> and then for Angus and Brahma. So 316, this is the favorable allele. 43% of the alleles in the Angus that were tested were favorable, and that explains part of the advantage we see in tenderness uh, for Angus. And Brangus a little bit below Red Angus, uh, but not dramatically so, and certainly nothing like what we see in Brahma. That they're certainly, I think, closer to the rest of the population than you think as a 3.8s, 5.8s would be. But sometimes I think, again, we miss this message and, and, and see a little different ear structure or see a set than we see on the others and assume that, that they're exactly the same in terms of their genetic makeup. And interestingly, if you sort of project a little bit on these Charlet and Angus and say, well, if, if the Angus is, is 43 and a Charlet Angus half-blood that's the average of 43 and something else comes out to 23, then you don't have to be a math major to, to think that, that at least in that, the, the Charlet gene sampled in that population are, are probably below where Brangus sits in that particular population. Calpane, again the favorable allele, 
very favorable to, to Angus, very unfavorable to Brahman, and Brangus in the same neighborhood as Red Angus and the half-blood Charlangus. Calpestatin, again, uh, sort of a similar trend, but really Brangus, Charlay, Angus half-bloods, that's the one where we see the big Brahman effect, but it didn't seem, at least in the carcass mare cattle, uh, with a lot of sires represented, large group of, of cattle, different ranches and those sort of things that, that actually the level of calcisatin favorable alleles in, in that Brangus population was really not any different than Angus. So I look at this a couple of ways. I look and say, well, that really if you look at the, at the genetic profile, that other than Calpane 316, the Brangus is right at, really among the rest of them, maybe a little bit behind Black Angus, but really not different from Red. In some cases, it's been advantageous to Red and some of the others. And also remember that you know there's opportunity there for all the breeds. Even Angus can improve the percentage of favorable alleles in their population if they want to select for more tenderness. And, and from a practical standpoint, I think we can probably fairly easily make any breed about as tender as we want it to be, because I think we've got some favorable tools to do that. So if, if you have customer clientele that you work with that are very concerned about tenderness, you know I think that you know if you have Brangus bulls that have been tested and have favorable alleles, and there are certainly ones out there, that they represent an opportunity. So just to kind of wrap it up and kind of put some thoughts together, at least my thoughts, and, and some, maybe some starting points for some discussion that you might have. Uh, you know, the Pringle data that we showed that no doubt Brahmins are inferior to Angus, but, but that the intermediates were, were maybe not as, as unfavorable as, as might have appeared at first blush. Certainly the GPE data has shown Brangus to be comparable to, to Continental when you combine the cycles. And when you look at the frequency of tenderness genes that really Brangus are not really different, and in some cases better than, than many of the continents. And you know, Brangus has, has really embraced technology as a breed, and it goes back to the Granada days, Joe, and some of that sort of thing. And some of the very first ultrasound work that was done, uh, Bob Shallis and others worked with with, with Brinks and, and some of those sort of things. Brangus is one of the early adopters of ultrasound technology, or an early adopter in terms of some of this technology, and I think it really can help them. It's helped them to some extent already. And some of the advantage I think that you see in terms of uh, of some of their advantage in carcass traits because they were one of the very early adopters of, of using ultrasound measurements and EPDs and that sort of thing. And they got a little bit of a jump on some of the other breeds in terms of, of catching up with some of the others. And just to kind of all together, you know, I was thinking about this before and, and Todd mentioned this a little bit and, and when you take some of his ideas and some of my ideas and some of the data and kind of stir it all up a little bit that, you know, I think it's clear any of the studies, we didn't talk specifically about percent heterosis we, that's another thing we look at sort of general. We think as half-bloods or half-bloods and all breeds combine the same. But if you really go back and look at the old dial -L papers and some of those that our predecessors did, you see that there are breed-specific heterosis factors. And no doubt it's always the case that an Indicus taurus heterosis level is greater. They're more different. They're more different in their gene frequency. And so the level of heterosis, the level of dominance that you extract when you cross a, a taurus and an Indicus is greater than taurus taurus. You know, I hear, as I teach animal breeding, you know, I'm torn on one hand because I hear students say to me, well, the market is saying Angus, Angus, Angus. How can I get as much Angus as I can? But yet at the same time, the heterosis is no doubt is an important factor of production. So how can you design a system that gets as much Angus genetics and as much heterosis as possible? And, and so when I think about that, that a Brangus, Angus cross probably gives you as much heterosis relative to Angus genes as you can probably extract because you can get the benefits of cow efficiency by making a Brangus, uh, a Taurus Indicus cross or some level of that, but also maintaining a black hide color. And it looks like the data indicates that the quality grades and beef palatability should be pretty 